All right, the waiting room has slowed down actually, so I won't wait till completely five past. I will just get started and then um, I will. Uh... Oh, okay, yeah, I will just get started and so people can join us as they as they come in. Um, okay, so welcome to um, today's book talk. Um, my name is Anna Mercer and I'm the organizer of book talk this year. Um, Today we're delighted to have Jack Searcy joining us to talk about her incredible work on the book Like Any Other Woman. And this is a book that speaks to the suffering that cancer causes and to the profound human experience of renegotiating the physical and emotional balance between sickness and health when that balance is tipped by the onset of disease. It is a profound and moving collaboration between an artist and a young woman who has endured the impact impact of a cancer diagnosis. So I'll just give some brief introductions to our two panelists today. So actually the structure of today's event will be Jack giving us a reading from her book. Um, and then uh, what will occur after that is uh, we will have the second panelist, which is Gwyneth Lewis, who we are delighted to be joining us to, who will then um, interview Jack about her work and then at the end of the event we come to the audience Q&A so that's when you can get involved tell us what you want us to ask the author and indeed what you want to ask Gwyneth as well who is also a creative writer um, so I'll just say some brief uh, biographical information bits about the two panelists and then I will hand over to Jack to begin the reading. So Jack is a visual artist and writer with a background in philosophy and anatomical sciences. Jack holds a PhD in fine art and is currently in the late stages of a second PhD, incredibly impressive, um, in critical and creative writing at Cardiff University. Jack is co a contributing writer and artist in residence with Synapsis, which is a health and humanities journal based at the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia University. Jack's work is primarily in the medical field, exploring the complex relations between art, practice, the humanities and biomedical science. And since Drawing Women's Cancer, so that's the project that inspired Like Any Other Woman, further projects have included working with patients with all forms of cancer, with medical professionals, and with women in Tanzania suffering from obstructive fistula. Jack's work is rooted in a specifically adapted autoethnographic approach, focusing on the empathetic articulation of the experience of illness and mortality in general through a creative synthesis of word and image. Jack lives in Cardiff uh, with her husband, her dog, her cat, and uh, her two guinea pigs, Anna Tortoise. She's got uh, multiple pets. <laughs> and she's also an award-winning cactus grower. So um, she has multiple talents as well as her um, uh, uh, obviously artistic and writing talents. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jack, for this author-led event. This is a really special event for a Cardiff book talk and we're really delighted you're here. Jack is in conversation with Gwyneth Lewis, and Gwyneth was Wales's national poet from 2005 to 2006. She wrote the bilingual words for the front of the iconic Wales Millennium Centre. She's an award-winning poet, and her most recent collection is Sparrow Tree, just published with Blood Axe Books. And she has published 17 books of poetry in total, and also books of non-fiction. And with Rowan Williams, a translation of the book of Taliesin. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, Gwyneth, you'll have to correct me. Um, and that was with Penguin Classics. Um, Gwyneth has received several awards. She's a freelance writer and teacher and has held a number of fellowships in the US where she's also taught at Princeton University and is a faculty member of Middleby College's Brief Life School of English in Vermont, where in 2016, she was the Robert Frost Chair of Literature. Her first nonfiction book was Sunbathing in the Rain, a cheerful book about depression. She received a Wellcome Trust Award to write a hospital odyssey about a carer's journey through cancer with her husband. So that's Gwyneth, who will be interviewing Jack after Jack's reading. So I will um, now hand over to our speaker. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much, Anna, for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> you didn't really have to mention the cacti. Um, I'm going to do two uh, readings. Uh, the first is from the first chapter of the book. Um, some, of it, some of it is somewhat praised, but 
I did that so that you can get a rough idea of what I was doing. And then the second reading will be about a particular uh, patient that I worked with by the name of Kate, um, who had endometrial cancer, but we'll get to that. So, Dr. T's sudden appearance at the door of the room brings the outside world into focus and shatters my quiet reverie. She's late, flustered. Only 15 minutes ago, she was in the theater, finishing up an operation that had turned out to be more complex than expected. And now she looks tired, maybe a little anxious. As I get up to greet her, the shards of my thoughts, unformed and fragile as they are, fall around me, even as Dr. T seems to gather her own and shrugs off any disquiet that remains about her morning's work. She grins happily on seeing me, and we hug, briefly, urgently. Then, after a rushed conversation about what it is about what is about to happen, and with a roll of her eyes towards the gathering crowd of women in the waiting area, she leaves as suddenly as she arrived, diving into the organized chaos of her own office. Through the wall, I hear the rustling of papers and the sound of the computer coming to life. And so it begins. I close the door quietly and wait. I'm in the vulval intraepithelial neoplasia, or VIN, clinic, which occupies a small suite of rooms in the Women's Centre at Landock Hospital in Cardiff. Part of the Cardiff and Vale University Health Board, Landock is the second largest hospital in the city, and its mission, as stated on its website, is perhaps unsurprisingly all about caring for people and keeping people well. Today, this mission is being accomplished at the Women's Centre as patients at all stages of their treatment for vulval disease come to see their respective consultants. Dr. T's list includes those women who have just been diagnosed, as well as those who have come for post-surgical follow-up appointments. Our idea is for her to ask the women, once the consultation is over, whether they'd like to talk with me about their experiences of their condition and the treatment measures that they're undergoing. But this is all new territory. Nothing is certain. And we have no idea whether anybody will agree to be involved. This is the very beginning of the Drawing Women's Cancer Project. It's early 2012. Aesthetically bare and with no windows, the room I'm in feels a little claustrophobic. The gray carpet is worn and stained in places. It bears a history of people's entrances and exits over the years of they have in here sat down to tell their stories and to be told with breath held for the moment of truth, the results of tests and biopsies. All of their relief, their disappointments, all of their hopes and their fears about their own mortality remain here as quiet whispers and fleeting shadows of meaningful yet interrupted lives. These walls painted with cold and indifferent grayish blue color give little comfort, although they harbor so much emotion. Some of the paint is peeling around the doorframe, but it reveals no warmth or respite from the relentless neutrality, just a powdery fragment of dirty white plaster. And even the door itself is painted in the same grayish blue as the walls. It's also a very heavy door. And I discover that it will close by itself with a bang unless it's propped open. The short wooden wedge that I find in the corner of the room is presumably there for that purpose. And I notice too the Yale lock Unusual, perhaps, for an internal door and strangely ominous, but I tell myself it must be there simply to assure a level of privacy. In the same way, the frosted glass panel at head height is obviously not for looking through. It lets in only a modicum of filtered light, which does little to soften the harsh glare of the fluorescent strip that's softly buzzing on the ceiling. The room is set up in the familiar consulting room style, but despite the stains on the carpet, it doesn't look as if it's used very much. There's nothing here to suggest a regular occupant, and in fact, there's nothing to distinguish this gray, impersonal space from any other consulting room in any other part of the hospital, except perhaps for the somewhat random posters about women's health that are tacked onto the wall. Just inside the door and pushed up against the wall, there's a desk ink stained and scratched like a desk in a school classroom. There are two chairs by it. And the one in front of the desk is large and upholstered in fake black leather. It rocks and swivels and it has a padded headrest. The other chair at the side of the desk and clearly intended for the patient is smaller. It's made of plastic and it looks hard and uncomfortable. 
Opposite the desk, standing heavily against the back wall of the room, are two grey metal filing cabinets, each one supporting a stack of books and what looked like medical catalogues on top of it. And on the wall between the desk and these cabinets, where it feels like there should have been a window, there's a sink with a tarnished mirror above. A second patient's chair is positioned awkwardly beside the sink. It looks out of place. The only other thing in the room is a clock above the desk. It's showing the wrong time, but it ticks loudly. The instinctive yet slightly depressing familiarity of the hierarchical setup in this drab and uninspiring room makes me want to rebel and rearrange the furniture. I feel the need, it's visceral, but I curb the impulse and try to convince myself, not without a twinge of guilt, that my choice to sit in the larger chair is purely based on comfort. The waiting area is filling up with patients now. Two other consultants are on duty with Dr. T and there are also appointments scheduled with specialist nurses. I can hear a murmuring of voices and a scraping of chairs resonating from the next room as Dr. T greets her first patient. I can only wait. Dr. T is naturally optimistic. During the many meetings we had to organize this visit, she was always confident that her patients would be willing to get involved. I am less so, but hopeful. And now waiting here alone in this drab room, I wonder how things will turn out. The murmuring continues. What news is the patient being given? Has the surgery gone well? If it was VIN, has the progression of the disease been halted? If it was cancer, has the tumor been removed? What next? Has pre-cancer developed into cancer itself? Might it already even have been cancer? It feels like an age, but actually I have to wait only 10 minutes before the murmuring stops in the office next door. Then just as suddenly as she had appeared earlier, Dr. T bursts excitedly into the room and introduces me to the first patient who has agreed to see me. Her name is Rebecca. Okay. And the next reading is from a later chapter in the book um, about, as I said, a lady called Kate who had endometrial cancer. She needed a hysterectomy, but fortunately because her tumor was quite well defined, she could have the minimally invasive procedure, a laparoscopy, commonly known as the keyhole surgery. And this piece I chose to read because it actually puts together the art and the science aspect of the project, I think, um, quite well. Dr. J draws up a low stool and seats himself at the end of the table between Kate's legs which are now raised in stirrups and spread apart. He needs to position a plastic device into her vagina before carefully suturing it onto her cervix at the neck of her womb. He tells me that the device will provide a hard surface to cut onto when the operation is underway. The device is a bright green color. Later, it will become startlingly luminous on the screen. Both surgeons are now standing either side of Kate and a junior doctor takes Dr. J's position between her legs. The green cloths are folded back to expose her abdomen, which is anointed with iodine, it is then filled, insufflated with carbon dioxide gas to such an extent that her belly swells to become grossly disproportionate to her slight frame and poignantly resembles a pregnancy. Dr. J tells me that the expansion elevates Kate's abdominal wall to create a space above her internal organs. This allows him to see very clearly via the laparoscopic camera, the area that he needs to work within. Carbon dioxide gas is used because it's common to the human body. It can be absorbed by tissue and removed through Kate's exhalation as her breathing is controlled and monitored. Importantly and reassuringly, Carbon dioxide is also non-flammable, an obvious asset where electrosurgical devices are being used. Working together and with immense concentration, Dr. J and Dr. M insert four separate instruments into Kate's abdomen, into the space expanded by the gas. The incisions through which the, laparos the laparoscopic camera, the two grippers and a diatherm are introduced are tiny. The diatherm is a kind of laser scalpel, which cauterizes as it cuts. 
Dr. J reaches up to make minor adjustments to the position of the video screens and the two surgeons begin to work. Physically detached from what they're actually doing inside Kate's body, the hands do control the instruments, but at arm's length. And the reality, the actual mechanics of all the searching and the cutting is only visible on the screens above. It's as if they're playing a video game, watching images that continuously change and move with a concentration that's extraordinary to witness. This is hand-eye coordination tested to its limit. My pen hangs idly in my fingers. My sketchbook remains closed. I cannot draw. I'm transfixed by the screens. Cut, cut, seal, cut. A multitude of images flitting in cinematic abandon whenever Dr. M or Dr. J moves the slender rod that holds the diaphragm or the camera inside Kate's body. They need to delimit the anatomical target area. The colors of the separate organs are translucent, like the oil glazes that I use when I'm painting. They move seamlessly over each other as the steel instruments begin to invade, just as the glaze moves over the scumble at the stroke of a brush over a canvas. As I watch the diatherm ruthlessly dissecting boundaries between tissue and hue, the imagery on the screen becomes almost hypnotic as art and science coincide and colors coalesce into a kaleidoscope of tonal value that favors every nuance and none. Despite myself, I cannot help thinking about color and my concentration wavers. In terms of the art science relation, which is indeed a fundamental driving force in the Drawing Women's Cancer Project as a whole, color itself can be understood as a fundamental linkage between the two. The power that color has in bringing art and science together, a power that's almost tangible here in the operating theater, comes perhaps in part from what Johannes Itten calls its beauty and imminent presence. The indication of religious fervor in Itten's protestations about his subject lacks subtlety and is made even plainer as he goes on to assure us that you have to love color before it will unveil its deeper mysteries. But as a leading figure of the Bauhaus, Itten himself straddled, straddled the boundary between subjectivity and objectivity, demonstrating that artists are certainly not the only ones to be moved by the guile of both nature's hues and their synthetic counterparts. It's an aside, as an artist, the mystery of color resides for me not so much in the practical use I put it to, and certainly not in any scientific or even religious understanding of it. For me, color demands a philosophical perspective. Author Stephen Melville may well have felt the same, as he at least posed the philosophical problem of color, even though he neglected to actually address it. But how to address without encountering gray areas? Derek Jarman wrote about gray as the sad world into which colors fall. Kandinsky's gray is void of resonance. Combinations of colors when mixed without care on a palette will always move towards gray. So Melville's color for color's sake must remain bottomlessly resistant to nomination, both subjective and objective. Color can appear as an unthinkable scandal. Kate's eyes are gray grayish blue. I fight my way back from my musings and watching the continuing invasion of Kate's internal organs as they flicker across the screen, I begin to feel disorientated within the unthinkable scandal. The transition from living form to two-dimensional video screen is confusing. My understanding of what I'm seeing becomes lost in the communicative space between and I struggle to recognize even which way round I'm actually seeing the organs that are being highlighted, silhouetted in transparent color in flat form. But suddenly all becomes clear in the champagne layer, the soft layer of veil of bubbles caused by the gas that float, sparkle and gently explode into tiny fingers of light inside the artificially inflated cavity that is Kate's abdomen. The surgeons smile at my involuntary gasp as I watch Kate's fallopian ligaments finally take comprehensible form just before they're separated and mercilessly severed. Now her uterus, the womb that carried and nurtured her sons, hangs forlornly between the ovaries, its broad ligament like the outstretched wings of a weak and dying bird, trapped, exposed, and inevitably vulnerable to predation. So much detail, so many metaphors, so much association and yet so many disassociations. 
In Kate's abdominal cavity, her blood begins to pool in smaller hollows and fissures between the organs. On the screen, it pulses with the deepest and richest of red hues, opaquely defying the colorful translucency of the surrounding tissues. But the blood is excess. It obscures the surgeon's view and is a hindrance to the work. A rich life source has now become merely an inconvenience for the meticulous procedure being carried out. And so it must be sucked out through a flexible tube, wasted, spent. In the clarity it leaves behind, the surgeons can locate the ligaments that secure the uterus to the body and they neatly sever them. Kate's womb, along with the cancer that invaded it, finally succumbs to being cut out by its very root. That's it. Well, um, I'll jump in here if I may. Um, uh, thank you, Jack. That's, uh, you, you just read one of the most astonishing passages uh, for me in the whole book, which is um, your unique take on colour uh, as an artist. Um, I, I want to say how um, uh, how much I rate this book. It's um, an entirely serious and thorough and beautiful and painful um, uh, journey into uh, or with um, women who are undergoing uh, gynecological cancer. Um, and um, I was very struck. I mean, people usually get interested in, in uh, cancer in particular when they or a member of their family um, is affected. Um, but uh, I, doctors, I was very struck by Dr. T's uh, question to you at the beginning. Can you draw what it feels like to have gynecological cancer rather than just what it looks like? And I wanted to ask you a simple question to begin with. How did this whole project begin? Right, okay. <laughs> I think I've always been interested in um, the human condition uh, in general. And that comes from the philosophy, philosoph bleh, philosophical background, I suppose. Also, I've been an artist and I wanted to learn how to render the human form uh, figuratively. And so I went to train in the classical um, tradition and learned how to render it in its perfect form, because that's what the classical tradition does, learn anatomy and everything else. And then I started after that thinking about how interesting the human form and condition was in its non-perfect form, because let's face it, most of us aren't perfect. Um, and that led to looking at the experience of illness and what illness meant and mortality in general. Um, and initially I started working with um, tuberculosis as a disease, but it was very esoteric and it was always in my studio on my own doing research. And it became apparent to me that I needed to get out there and talk with people um, and, and take it out. So I was very fortunate to get invited to uh, meet with Dr. T who we talked about it. She was a, a gynecological surgeon specializing in vulval cancer and explained to me how rare vulval cancer was, um, but ne nevertheless, how de devastating it was. Um, and that there was very little information or anybody doing anything about it. And then she asked me that question and I realized that she knew exactly where I was coming from. Um, so we started drawing women's cancer. Um, cancer, um, I suppose when I was asking, I wasn't, uh, I was asking really um, from personal experience, uh, given that my husband is a uh, uh, in remission from uh, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I certainly know that I never thought about cancer until I had to. Yeah. What on earth would make you um, face such a painful subject uh, voluntarily? Well, I mean, obviously we've all, I would imagine most of us have had experience either directly or indirectly with cancer and I've certainly had my share. Um, cancer is overwhelming in the sense that it's everywhere and everything. 
you can get cancer of more or less every single part of your of your body and that was what was interesting for me um the sort of direction into gynecological cancer was not by accident but it was it was what was there and that's how i started and obviously it was working with women as well which was um very good to do and the the relationship that i built with with some of the women even in such a short time period was quite profound um but i was interested in cancer in a much broader way as well which is why i've gone on and done uh other projects to do with cancer with women and with men with with all people um with a bit of a diversion into obstetric fistula as well which is obviously a gynecological condition um I have to say that your um, willingness and presence with uh, the women that you write about and that you draw um, is extraordinary. Your, uh, um, the, the respect that you show to them and to their privacy and the care with which you try not to intrude more than you have to is, is really moving, uh, Jack. Thank you. I think it's just a case of... Um, I'm not criticizing the NHS and what goes on, um, but clearly people who work in the NHS don't have the time to sit and care for the patients and talk to the patients and do all the sorts of things that they would like to be able to do, but they just don't have the time. So my being there on the wards um, and talking with the patients with no time limit and with no boundaries around what they could say or I I think was a positive thing for them and it's just the way I operate in general I I like to get to the humanity of whoever I'm I'm with at the time I I don't do small talk I'm afraid (laughs) it's just the way I am well I'm not sure that you that's true actually I I can speak as a former student of yours because uh I went to Jack a few years ago to learn drawing, uh, looking for somebody local to do that. So I think you do have uh, more small talk than you think. Um, but this is a, it, this is a remarkable um, weaving together, this book, of so many different media. You know, we have, uh, if I just outline them quickly for people who haven't read the book yet, but I urge you to <laughs> read and read it carefully. I read every word. Uh, um, it, there is your descriptions, as you've read about the description of the, um, for example, the waiting room, um, mm-hmm. you as a person. And then there's um, uh, uh, Becky's uh, inclusion of some of Becky's uh, writing, uh, Becky being one of the uh, the women that you travelled with. She was Rebecca, the first one. Rebecca, I beg your pardon. Well, no, her name is Becky, but that was the lady who came to me at the very beginning she was the very first person I saw. I see. And she's the one that you stay with throughout the book. Yes. Um, then, there's your, th- then there's your academic uh, knowledge of the subject, uh, the kind of ethnography, as you were saying. But there's also then the, um, the drawings that you make, plus oh. your knowledge. You, you, you know as much about anatomy as the surgeon. <laughs> because you do teach anatomical drawing so you know it so it's a very unique blend that um can you talk a little bit about how you um how easy it was or was it completely natural to blend all those sides of your interests um yes to that last question i if i don't write i can't paint if i don't paint i can't write it's just the two things feed off of each other um if I can't think through things I mean I learned anatomy superficial anatomy I would point out not internal I know a little bit about internal but nowhere near like the surgeons um but I started learning it when I started to learn how to draw it and me being me took it further and so I did qualifications in anatomy and um I do um dissection cadaveric dissection as well to find out more um and it all essentially i would call myself an artist i'm a painter a drawer but everything is part of that um i can't none of it is what i do it's what i am 
I know that sounds a bit oh, arrogant. I don't mean to, but I just can't conceive okay. of not doing one or the other, you know? That makes a massive amount of sense to me. And that's one of the things I've uh, uh, really um, loved talking to you as we were, I was drawing bad yeah. wine bottles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your vocation as an artist. And it is, it, it's something you do because it's something that you are. Yes, I would like to point out very quickly as well that the exhibitions that we did have exhibitions for Drawing Room is Cancer, and I made a point of always putting them in um, all of my project work, actually, in places where not commercial galleries. We had one in the library in Cardiff, we had it in the Senate, um, at the RCOG in London, the obstetric fistula ones went to New York um, in a cafe and a university gallery. I want to put the work where everybody can engage with it rather than having it some esoteric um, pictures on a wall. I'm, I'm, I'm not like that as an artist. So, um, and that was part of the project so that everybody could engage with it. You, um, you, you, um, in, in the book, we, there was a fascinating um, exchange with one of the, um, patients, you were drawing a series of uh, before and after drawings of an operation. Um, could you tell us, and, and the comment from the patient was that uh, it your drawing was far less uh, impersonal or frightening or than a photograph would be. Depersonalizing, I think is the word. Well, we did. Um... The vulva cancer started as a, as a pilot project. And one of the patients that I was with um, said that she had been diagnosed with vulval cancer and she was in shock and then sort of walked across the waiting room to find a leaflet about it in a, in a bookshelf full of leaflets about all sorts of cancer. And there wasn't one on vulval cancer, um, which was really, I found appalling. So we, made a leaflet with a PhD student who was a medical student and I got together and I made these drawings of a vulva, uh, a cancerous vulva, and then um, directly after the operation and then six weeks after the operation as in directly illustrations from photographic reference, um, really quite raw. Um, and then we took them to patients and said, a small group of patients said, here is a photograph, here is a drawing, here is a diagram, which one connects to you more? And all of them said the drawing because the photograph objectified them. It could have been any woman's vulva. The diagram they didn't understand and the drawing they could understand and they felt better about it because they felt that somebody had taken time to do it and therefore that person cared. So we put the drawings in the leaflet. <laughs> Take note, everybody who's responsible for these um, leaflets, I think uh, that, that says, you know, because the, the, the drawing, it, it's not objective drawing, is it at all? It's your, um, your care and also your eye for the beauty of the human body. Well, there too. Yeah, I mean, some people think I'm a bit strange because I, I do dissection and I make paintings and drawings of the dissections and people, you know, some of them are quite challenging. Um, but I, I think that the, the colors and the, the form of every, it's beautiful. The human form is beautiful inside and out. I think that's one of the uh, overriding uh, feelings of reading the book is your appreciation for um, not only the wonders of the body and uh, what the medical profession is able to achieve. I mean, you 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 talk about the surgeons like hunting cancer. You know, <laughs> I, I thought that was a very uh, vivid image. Um, but also, you wonder about how resilient people are. Mm. Unbelievable. I mean, some of the women that I met, obviously Becky herself, but all of the other women, there wasn't one who I wasn't in awe of because going through that it's just I mean the the hysterectomies I mean I, I know that I've had that um 
and I don't think I could have been as well. Let's move on. <laughs> These are deep waters, aren't they? Uh, it's it's. I can do it, but it's difficult to talk about it. If you know what I mean. Yes, I um, do. I do. Yeah. And and um, you know, uh, I just read the whole book with a, a, a real solemn appreciation of the depth of your vocation for this work. Um, it makes sense of all sides of you as a person and as an artist. Um, and I was deeply uh, touched by that seriousness. Not that you don't know how to have a laugh, you do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's that profound seriousness. How long have you, could you maybe before we go on and talk a bit more about the, this actual project, but about how long have you known you were an artist? In all your, you know, in all your uh, media. My father put a pen into my hand, you know, the dip pen. I remember them, yes. <laughs> One of my earliest memories. Oh. And that's it. You know, he was an excellent draftsman. Um, and I can't remember not having drawn or painted since then, really. Was, was your father a professional draftsman? No, no, he worked as, he was in a printing works, oh. again, which was very evocative for me. Yes, ink. I love the ink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, I've, I can't, even before then, they tell me that I was drawing. So it's just one. And, and then um, did you ever not think of being an an artist as the centre of your life, shaping it, all of it. Or, because uh, I've had periods of revolt from being a poet, because I yeah. No. I, <laughs> no, yeah, I had that feeling that you wouldn't have. I, I, if I can't, I mean, I go away and I'll go away for, a, say, a month um, and writing is fine, um, but I ache to come back to the studio. I miss the studio. I, if I can't, you know, if I'm in a place where I can't paint, then... It's difficult and, you know, um, they just go hand in hand, quite literally. I used to use a lot of text, actually, physically in the work. I tend not to do that so much now, but um, in some of the works that are for Drawing Room is Cancer and certainly in Obstetric Fistula, there's a lot of text. Uh, um... I want to talk for a moment about there's a, a one of my another one of my favorite passages so much I've copied it out and that's a <laughs> because, uh, if I copy it out it's uh, it takes effort but you've got a um you're watching I think it's that same passage actually with Karen is it uh the lady who had the hysterectomy by la laparoscopy la la I can't say it. Hate. I beg your pardon, I got the initial right. So you say there, the colours of the separate organs are translucent, like the oil glazes that I use when I'm painting. They move seamlessly over each other as the steel instruments begin to invade, just as the glaze moves over the scumble at yes. the stroke of a brush over canvas. I had to look up the word scumble because I'm... I'm Sorry. <laughs> that is an amazing couple of sentences because you're actually as you're you're almost as if you're painting the body into existence by describing it and of course it's not in paint it's in words you're scumbling in words well there's a whole thing going on there isn't there there's the film and then there's the words and then there's the painting and yeah yeah it's I mean it's it's just the way I think. <laughs> but it's, um, I think that the, uh, possibly the most vivid, uh, as you'd expect from a painter like you, the most vivid passages are the ones where you, uh, where you can see that nature and art are not separate. Mm. Indeed, it's it's all well. It's my nature. Uh, everything. It, it's all about language and dialogue. 
I, I use conventional language, I use visual language. Um, so, I mean, this, the, the way that the project was working out was that I went and had a dialogue with the patient, the lady. I then had a dialogue with what I was seeing in the operating theater. I then had a dialogue with the painting itself when I was doing it, the drawing. And then other people had a dialogue with that drawing when they engaged with it. It's all about dialogue, really, and lang language itself and textual language, visual language, they aren't any different. Mm. In, 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 in terms of um, meaning. I like that very much, dialogue. Um, because the, it, you know, the medical interventions, yes, there's consultation, there's uh, dialogue about treatment, da da da. Um, but really, the activity of surgery is, is is not a dialogue, is it? It's it's quite. Um, some of your descriptions are really quite. I think you you say uh, controlled carnage. Um, that's the, the open. I'm getting a lot of feedback. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Okay? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that was the abdominal hysterectomy. Um, just open. The whole body was open. I was quite shocked at what I saw. I mean, it was. It needed to be done, but it's a huge operation. Um, yeah. <laughs> draw a distinction between what a doctor does and you know if a doctor is a cancer hunter you want them to be remorseless and thorough. Yeah I mean we had this I had this conversation with uh, the lady who wrote the preface to the book um, Alison who is a self a surgeon and I think she was a little bit uh, backing away from that image of the, hun the hunter if you like um, I would disagree that there isn't a dialogue in what they do. There is a dialogue with their tools, with their hands, especially with the invasive, the minimally invasive. Um, as, as a byline, there's a, a lot of dialogue going on in operations. It's remarkable. The, what I really found quite astonishing was the fact that they could carry on a conversation about football or what they'd done at the weekend, while certainly in Maria's case and another um, chapter while they were pulling out her intestines <laughs> it was just a kind of uh, routine thing to prepare them to get into the uh, cancer in the bowel and they were talking about what they'd watched on tv perhaps they're in dialogue <laughs> with something else aren't they it's, it's, it's different it's, it's yeah. listening to something different yeah you know, listen to their medical education and the feel of things and so on and so forth whereas what you're right. Responding with your whole being as an artist to the situation. I do. I, I can't speak for them. I, I, I would say that they do too in a different way. Yeah. Mm. Certainly the, the anesthetist, that, that impresses me enormously. The, the guy that's checking the breathing all the time. And I see such levels of kindness just that sort of little hand stroking a piece of hair away from the forehead of the person, or there's an awful lot of that that goes on in the midst of the, the sheer, utter, unadulterated objectivity, which is necessary. Mm. I wouldn't want a surgeon to operate on me unless he was objective. <laughs> sure. No, no, indeed. Um, so, um, what are you working on now then, Jack? Uh, um, and how, how is this project moving on? Well, it moved on through, um, in, we did a, a project on breast cancer specifically, um, but then I started doing uh, the PhD, the second PhD. Um, and that's based on another project that I went on from breast cancer, which is called Cancer Ward 12. And in that project, um, it was a slightly different in that I did a residency. I stayed for two weeks on oncology ward 12 in um, Singleton Hospital in Swansea and just basically lived on the ward. I stayed two or three nights as well um, and just insinuated myself into the daily life of the ward. And 
all sorts of stories, as you can imagine, came from that same thing, talking with patients and transcribing and making artwork. And that is now being turned in this PhD into a uh, novel, sort of non-fiction merging with fiction um, and artwork. So that's my main focus at the moment. Second PhD, you're a glutton for punishment, but it, well, it sounds I'm, like a re that you're pushing on the the form even further. So yeah. I can't yeah. wait to read that. Yeah, thank you. It's 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 fantastic. I'm having a great time. I'm working with uh, Richard Gwynn, who is a really good supervisor to work with, and Aidan Tynan. Um, I did it really, I think, because I I'm not used to writing fiction, um, and I wanted to see if I could. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to submit in 23, I believe. Um, but it's been a really, really good experience. Well, I wish you, uh, the very best of luck with it. And, um, uh, I, I, I just, um, in awe of you because, uh, <laughs> uh I, I've been lucky enough to see your studio and I, I know, uh, one in particular of your paintings very well. <laughs> that I bought it um but uh it's it's always um very stimulating to me um to to talk to you and and also to to just witness the like i say the the profound uh respect that you not only hold for other people but also for your own vocation and that's i find that very inspiring and very helpful so uh, i think Thank you very much and thank you for agreeing to do this. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And I'm going to hand back now, if I may, to Anna, who is going to do uh, the questions and answers. Well, the questions anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. thank you both so much. Um, I think inspiring is the right word. Um, <laughs> Gwyneth just used uh, Stephanie what that discussion was for me. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, uh, and uh, thank you, Jack, also for your wonderful reading. Um, so now we have the opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Um, you have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can pop a question in there um, or you can put it in the chat if that's easier. Um, please do um, send us your questions. Um, so we have a bit of time now for a further discussion. Um, I thought I might um, kick off with a question, Jack, if that's okay. <laughs> I mean, I have a quite a few, but um, uh, I wanted to say immediately, I really loved that that dialogue. Well, I liked the, the way you both just talked about dialogue and how important that was in, in the discussion you were having. Um, but my question was actually about um, setting. So when I was reading your work, um, and this did come up a bit in your chat with Gwyneth, but when I was reading your work, uh, I found uh, there was an incredibly profound sense of setting and space and the importance of understanding what these clinical environments are like, uh, especially for the not just the patients, but the families and loved ones that, that uh, spend time in those environments. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more from your kind of uh, perspective of as an artist and a writer of, of how you feel that sense of clinical space kind of shaped the way your depiction of emotions in the book uh, came about. And um, were there any particular moments when being in a medical environment um, was particularly overwhelming or memorable for you, or indeed, if you think you can say this, um, for uh, uh, the, the women you spoke to in the book. So there's quite a lot in there, sorry, but um, I really, I really, it really stayed with me the way you, you talked about these places, um, uh, someone who doesn't have um, um, experience of that. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, no, I think you've picked on, on something that's really quite important to me. Uh, I do like, to write descriptively about the setting and where I am. And I'm not used to hospitals either. So going into it was quite daunting, at least at first for me as well. Um, and but what I wanted to try to sort of pull out there was this ordinariness, the drabness, the, the lack of warmth of most of the environments until of course you've got someone in there and two human bodies are in there. There is a chapter um, 
uh, which describes the quiet room, um, which the furniture was just dreadful. And, you know, the patient I was with said, oh, well, if I sit in that sofa, I won't get up again because I sat in it and hit the floor and things like that. So people make places. But I think in order to uh, get that over in a piece of writing, it's probably a good idea to be a bit descriptive of the space itself. I think not in this project, but in the obstetric fistula one, um, that was quite um, daunting, really. I went over there and we saw the operating theatre where they did the operations there. And there's operating theatres and then there's that one. Um, and it was, I made a, a piece of work that was essentially a, a drawing of that room and how horrendous it was in our perception of what an operating theatre should be. Um, so I think, yes, place for me is very important. Less so in the paintings, actually. The paintings are more about the figures, but in, in the writing, I like to make the setting real. I don't know if that answers anything. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder if, um, leading on from that, so uh, I did mention briefly at the beginning, because when you, you told me about yourself and your work uh, more broadly, that you have been working with women in Tanzania um, suffering from this condition. I mean, can you tell us any, any more? I would like to hear more about that as, as something that, has that been something you're going to be writing about? Or uh, when was that? And um, All right, okay. Um, yeah, well, it came out because one of the, the surgeons that I was working with on this project um, had done four years in Tanzania and uh, working at this obstetric fistula uh, clinic where women came to from villages all around uh, the area, often on foot, sometimes on the bus and God knows what. Um, obstetric fistula, I'm not sure if you know, if, I don't want to... No. Right, well, it's a hole between um, the uh, bladder or the rectum, or sometimes both, and the uh, vagina. So the girls who have it are uh, constantly, continuously um, being um, uncontrollably, and usually they're very, very young because of the culture being such that they get married young and they have pregnancies that their bodies aren't mature enough to manage so they have real terrible births etc cetera, etc cetera. I don't want to go too much into it and it might upset people but um, anyway uh, she said can you do the same in there in obstetric fistula as you've done with women's cancer and I said well there's just one way to find out so fortunately she was able to get funding and we went off there and did it and uh, the Royal College of Ops and Gynes in London got to hear of this and sponsored us um, for to do an exhibition and everything else. And we were able then to uh, give back. Um, and then Johnson and Johnson got involved with it and they wanted the exhibition in New York. And I said, you can't have it because RCOG asked first. Um, but if you fund me to go again, because I want to go to uh, not the clinic this time, but the rehabilitation center, I will, you know, you will have a larger show. You'll have two shows, if you like, in one. So they did that, um, which was great. The opportunity was great. Um, and I was able to sell some of the work and give some money back to the clinic, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, but going there was life changing. I know that's a cliche, but it really, really was. It really makes it made me think about what it was to be a woman uh, and even more so just a human being. Um, I couldn't speak uh, the language, obviously, although I spoke a few words when I got back. But they sing their way of, you know, they're really, really into singing. And so when we turned up, myself and the surgeon, Oh, we didn't want it, but they stood up. The poor ladies stood up and sang for us. Um, so we didn't really know what to do. I looked at her, she looked at me, and I said, I'm going to sing for them. And I did. I just stood there and sang a Scottish folk song in the middle of their banda. Um, and after that, it was great. And that was dialogue again. It was a way of 
getting in there. And after that, I just sat around drawing them. And the whole concept was strange for them. I asked them to sit so I could draw them. And they kept getting up and looking at what I was doing, which wasn't really the point because <laughs> I couldn't draw them. But I, it was an experience I will never forget. And I would, I would like to go back. I mean, obviously, all of this work is very little funding. I mean, drawing is cancer is pretty much done on, on nothing. Um, I would like to go back there, but I can't, you know, until I get some funding to do so. There's so much more, so much more. I'd like to go to the villages where the girls come from, and there are some horror stories. Uh, babies, are, uh, most of the babies are still born, and they are laid out in the sand outside the hut and things like that. This stuff should be known. But there's a lot of charities now working with that. So... Yeah. Well, I suppose linking that, I mean, thank you for, for your answer there. It's something um, um, incredibly um, moving and, and yeah, uh, important to hear about. I mean, I suppose a, a really broad question, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, is maybe uh, linking that to uh, like any other woman um, and that work you did there and your other work. Do, do you find that people... Uh, do you find these kind of conditions difficult to talk about? Is that a frustration of yours? I mean, I mean, not to, you know, make it about kind of uh, a, a trivial emotional experience, but I just mean, is that something you think people should be, should be talking about it more, obviously? Um, and I just wondered what you thought of that as someone who is an expert. Um, I, I think, yes, it, it should be talked about more. And I think it should be talked about more on a human level rather than on a level where uh corporate entities are going over as, as I saw happening and filming everything and, um, you know, picking up a child and having a photograph, a photo shoot with it, because that doesn't mean anything. It, it's, it, you just go over there and be ordinary, a person, a human being, rather than somebody who's trying to aggrandize themselves. I, I'm sorry, I'm really going to, on a soapbox here, but I think if there was more reality to what the charities are trying to do, um, they would do better. And it's not that I don't want to talk about it. It's just that I find it, so it's, it's like speaking the unspeakable. That's where I move to painting. If you understand, it's difficult to put it into words. And a painting says, so much more it, it's unlimited because it has its dialogue with you or with anybody else you know conventional language is, is boundary it's limited yes you can seek other meanings in it but ultimately there's a framework it has to be understood in a particular way mm -hmm. by people who read English or people who don't or whatever whereas a painting can be seen by anybody who speaks any language yeah. and see something in it and I retreat into, I mean, some of this stuff has been really, really hard. Um, and I don't protect myself. I retreat into the work because if I uh, protected myself behind corporate walls or behind objectivity or I'm a researcher, or um, then I wouldn't be able to get to what I want to get to. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a great answer. Um, I don't know if anyone from the audience has any questions. I don't know if you want to type into the chat box or into the Q&A box if anyone has anything they would like to ask Jack at this stage. Um, I mean, uh, we'll kind of give it a second. Um, I mean, this is a, a, a completely different tangent, but I was also wanting to ask you if, if I can be self-indulgent. Um, that, that when you were talking about color and Gwyneth obviously talked to you about color in such a fascinating way and what you read, but what you said about color. Um, and you also kind of talked about some artists, other artists there. And I just wondered, um, uh, it's quite a cheesy question maybe, but uh, are there are other artists that you are particularly inspired by um, <laughs> writers in, in your work. It's something that I think at Book Talk, uh, yeah. we like to ask creatives who come on um, oh. to kind of share that idea of who, who, who is reading or engaging with, uh, with, uh, with other uh, arts. So, there you well, go. 
I think most people won't be, won't be surprised that I uh, I like Francis Bacon very much, mm-hmm. um, but essentially it's a lot of the um, the masters, if you like, that I turn to because of you know the classical techniques. I mean, the work that I do in in terms of painting is um, it is based on a classical technique, but with a, a very contemporary um, turn to it. Um, I, I teach that way. So Francis Bacon, odd nerdrum, um, who is very odd. Uh, he suits his name. But when I do the diplomas painting with my students, I always have them do a master copy from him. Um, but anybody figurative. I mean, even things, Giacometti, the sculptor, um, he was incredible draftsman. But really, I have more influences in terms of the writing than I do with the painting. The painting, I'm fairly sort of individual. <laughs> <I think. laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Um, so it is um, just past eight o'clock now. I think what we'll do is, um, you know, this is a, a, a very difficult subject. And maybe if uh, we stop the recording in a moment and make it a slightly more informal space Hello. for um, uh, anyone in the audience who might want to ask something maybe it's personal for them and they don't necessarily want to, it to be recorded um, so we will we will kind of stay here and, and Jack will be here a little bit longer if you would like to ask a question but it not be kind of uh, in the recorded part of the session um, but Jack would you like to say anything else about 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 the book um, to kind of close with um, well, not that you need to make another case for why people should read it, but, you know, um, um, your work in this field and, and, and what it means to you. Oh, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I notice on Amazon it's gone down in price as well. So if anybody wants oh, to buy it, it's gone down to half price, which is grand. Um, but it can be downloaded for free, as, as people know. I mean, um, it's, it's written in the sense uh that I, I i wanted to write it not it's not an anthology but i wanted to write it so that people could read a chapter here or a chapter there so it's not something that you need to read from start to finish or even in the right order um because there are some chapters that might um again as you say it's a very very challenging subject i've you know i've had this a lot with my work not that it makes me be any less challenging but it is up, upsetting for a lot of people um most people, uh, most of the shows we've had, we've had people in tears or, you know, it brings up an awful lot of stuff and, you know, something and you quite right, maybe recording it, you know, some people are a bit wary of that. When we have the shows, we have a um, private box for people to write comments in and shove it in the box and anonymously and this sort of thing. It's not something that is talked about uh, very much, but perhaps that's part of the point. It should be talked about more, and certainly death and dying and this sort of stuff, which is what I'm tackling a bit more now in in the work that I'm doing for the PhD, which is perhaps even more hard hitting. But <sighs> will you your know? PhD lead to another book? Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Mm-hmm. I hope yeah. So. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Really for that. Um, Colin, um, my colleague Colin has very helpfully put the link to the ebook, um, which is open access in the chat. So if you haven't had access to that already, then. Yeah, I mean, Cardiff Uni Press were really, really brilliant, um, fantastic people to work with. Um, so, yes, I would I would recommend them if anybody else has got a monograph in within the university, uh, you know, think about them because they were they were excellent the whole process was really really easy I mean I've had a book published before um but this was just super smooth super easy and the quality of it is very good as well actually I was I was impressed it's a fantastic piece of work um yeah um okay we will uh just close the stop the recording there um but we will uh, be here if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question off the recording then when I recording ends then we can um, uh, open that floor to questions um, thank you formally to Jack and Gwyneth uh, especially Jack for being our author leading this event today thank you
You're very welcome. Thank you for having me.